Right, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Kang from UNIST. Um, today, um, I'll be talking about um, the factors that control the tropical rainfall distribution. And I'll be, uh, I'll, um, this talk will be, we'll try to give you a grand tour of how the climate change in one region and in the globe affects um, the climate over um, the remote regions. So I'll be, uh, I think my talk will be quite distinct from other talks because um, I'll be um, focusing on the large scale phenomenon. Okay, so let me start uh, by showing you um, the map of um, tr precipitation in contours and the shading shows um, the surface temperature. Okay. So um, you can clearly see that in the tropics, there is a band of heavy precipitation, right? And that's called um, the ITCZ, Intertropical Convergence Zone. Right? And as you can see, um, the precipitation over the ITCZ has sharp meridian gradients. Okay? So even a small displacement in the ITCZ location can cause dramatic changes in local precipitation. So for example, the place uh, which was um, 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 humid at one point, in response to just one degree of ITCZ shift, um, it can become completely dry. So it's important, uh, critically important, to understand what, uh, um, what controls the ITCZ position. Okay. So let me um, ask you a question. Um, so do you think um, the thermal forcing, like heating or cooling, in the tropical region, in the low latitude, would be more effective at perturbing the ITCZ location or would you expect the forcing far away from the equator, like uh, polar forcing, would be more effective at perturbing the ITCZ? Okay. Uh, please have that question in mind, and I will ask the same question uh, later on. Okay. Uh, by the way, the distance between the equator and the pole is 10,000 kilometer away. Okay. Um, so traditionally, um, tropical precipitation was considered to be mainly controlled by local tropical mechanisms that affect um, tropical sea surface temperatures. Right? Um, the tro ITCZ is located in the low latitude, so it's um, somewhat um, natural to think that ITCZ it will be just affected by the tropical mechanisms. However, more recently, um, the community um, has recognized that extra tropical forcing, forcing outside the um, tropics, um, is also a key source of tropical climate variability. And I will, later on, I will try to convince you that extra tropical forcing um, is the key source um, for modulating the tropical precipitation distribution. Okay. Um, so I will start by showing that um, extratropical forcing can have significant impact on the tropical rainfall. Uh, before uh, going into the uh, main topic, let me tr um, just uh, give you a uh, background. Um, here is the zone of mean net radiation. Um, the the x-axis is latitude from South Pole to North Pole. Okay? And this green line is the amount of um, net um, solar radiation reaching that region. Right? So obviously, there is more insulation uh, reaching the low latitudes than the high latitudes. Right? This is one on. And this red dashed line is the amount of energy uh, radiated out to space, outgoing long wave radiation. Right? So in the low latitudes, um, there is more energy coming in than going out. So there is energy surplus. Right? And in the high latitudes, there is more energy going out than coming in. So there is energy deficit, right? So if, the, if this net um, radiation imbalance were to just stay there, then we would expect temp uh, indefinite um, temperature increase in the tropics and indefinite temperature reduction in the high latitudes, right? But that's not the case, right? We have almost constant climate, although it's warmer in the tropics, but it's constant. Right? So that means there, this um, um, surplus of energy has to be transported forward. Right, uh, into the region with energy um, deficit. And this shows um, the northward energy transport, uh, again, with la in terms of latitude from South Pole to North Pole. So positive means um, northward transport. So it's telling you that in the Northern Hemisphere, there is northward energy transport. And in the Southern Hemisphere, there is southward energy transport. Okay. So this climate um, system as a whole is transporting energy forward and to balance, make the balance. 
And that's um, accomplished by both atmosphere and ocean. Right? Those are the two mediums that can transport energy in the climate system. And we can decompose um, this energy transport into the part accomplished by atmosphere in green and the part that's accomplished by ocean in blue. So in the middle latitudes, the atmosphere is uh, dominates, atmosphere dominates the forward energy transport, uh, whereas in the deep tropics, ocean transport is actually more important. Okay, so now um, these schematics show you just examples of how the ocean and atmosphere um, transport energy meridionally. Um, so in the um, here, this is the Atlantic. In the northern North, North Atlantic the water is so dense that it sinks to deep water in the northern North Atlantic. And that deep water um, um, travels to the south and rises um, near the Antarctica. Okay. And then the surface water um, transports, uh, um, uh, uh, travels um, to the northward, again to the northern North Atlantic. So because the surface water is warmer, and the uh, deep water is colder, we can expect that this um, so-called thermal haline circulation will transport energy northward across the equator. Okay? And that is actually the reason why the northern hemisphere is warmer on average than the southern hemisphere. Okay? And here shows um, how the atmosphere transports energy. So in the, near the equator, um, the air is warm, so it rises. And in the upper branch, um, the air diverges and in the subtropics, the air sinks, and in the lower branch, um, the air converges toward the equator. And because the potential energy of air masses in the upper branch is much larger than the potential energy of air masses in the, near the surface, so um, the energy transport um, is to the pole, uh, toward the pole, following the upper branch direction uh, by the headless circulation. So this, is, um, uh, this shows how energy transport is accomplished in the climate system. So now um, let me try to convince you that extra tropics, right, um, far away from the tropical region, um, is really important for understanding the ITC's location. Okay. So here, sh um, uh, in this paper, the authors put fresh water. They dumped fresh water in the northern North Atlantic. So by putting off, uh, dumping fresh water here, they are making the water less dense, right? So I told you that um, the water sinks here, so there will be less sinking, right? There will be less sinking. So that effect is to weaken the, this so-called thermal haline circulation, right? So my, by making this thermal haline circulation weaker, um, um, this uh, where they are reducing the northward um, energy transport by the ocean, right? Because I told you that um, this effect is to transport energy northward across the equator, right? So, um, so this effect um, by um, putting fresh water, dumping fresh water in here, that's to make the, this northern extra tropics cooler. Okay? And then what they observe is, this is the um, um, tropical precipitation and here, this um, blue is drying, and uh, red is um, moistening. So you can observe that the tropical precipitation is shifted southward, right? Even though the forcing is far away uh, from the tropics, you can clearly see a very large response in the tropics. Right? That's one example. And in, in another paper, they um, prescribed additional ice in the northern extra tropics. So again, you expect that this will um, make the northern hemisphere cooler, right? And as a result, the, we have a southward shift of the ITCZ, right? Um, amazingly, the local precipitation response is actually smaller. And you, the largest response in precipitation occurs in the tropics, okay? And another example uh, is uh, um, on the surface emissions in the northern um, extra tropics. So we have shown that um, the surface emissions, the surface, which reflect solar radiation in the northern hemisphere, uh, makes the northern hemisphere cooler, and that, um, tr um, that acts to shift the tropical rain band um, southward. Okay. So, and the major countries emitting sulfate are located in, located in East Asia. 
So what, what we're doing, what, uh, we're, the air pollution is not just um, affecting the health of local population, but it also affects um, the, um, the population in remote regions uh, by, uh, by modulating the uh, precipitation. Right? So here, uh, because of the southward shift of tropical rain belt, th um, uh, this is the region where the Africa or Sahel is located. So because we are arguing here that because of air pollution in East Asia, the, the Sahel, the Africa region, uh, suffered from drought, severe drought, which affected um, so many population in, uh, over this region. So uh, this is telling you that um, we have to be really conscious about what we do and also be responsible. Okay. And, and one of the um, signatures of global warming is a um, forward extension of tree line. Right. So to, uh, to investigate that effect, we have prescribed more vegetation over the Arctic. Right. So then there will be less solar um, uh, radiation reflection because once it was ice, it's covered by vegetation. So there is um, um, less solar radiation, uh, solar reflection. So that's to make um, this um, northern extra tropics warmer. Okay. Then what we observe is a northward shift of tropical precipitation. So there are actually many, many other studies um, that show this extra tropical forcing can have an impact on the ITCC location. Okay. So then the question is, how can you understand that behavior? Okay. So I will try to um, uh, in, I will introduce a theory uh, based on atmospheric energy balance. Okay. So again, here's the headless circulation that I showed you early, er, earlier. There, there is a rising branch um, near the equator, and there is upward branch, and near the surface, uh, the air converges toward the equator. Right? And because potential energy is larger in the upper branch, energy is transported forward by the headless circulation, whereas moisture is more abundant um, near the surface. So moisture is transported toward the equator um, in the, uh, by the headless circulation. Right. So as moisture converges to the, um, to the equator, then air rises and it condenses and precipitates. So this um, rising branch of the headless circulation can be regarded as the ITCZ location. Okay. So we're, I will try to understand the factors controlling the ITCZ location by um, understanding what controls the uh, rising branch of the headless circulation. Okay. So let me just um, um, qualitatively um, introduce a theory by um, introducing you how to explain the seasonal migration of the ITCZ or seasonal uh, cycle of the headless circulation. Okay. So let's first look at the boreal summer case. Okay. In boreal summer, we have more insulation coming in uh, to the northern hemisphere, right? Then relatively, the southern hemisphere is cooler. Okay then um, the, this head circulation has to transport energy southward, right, toward the cooler hemisphere. The, um, the head circulation needs to transport energy um, southward toward the cooler hemisphere. Then in the lower branch, the um, moisture is transported northward. So we expect the ITCZ or the ascending um, branch of the head cell to be located um, north of the equator. So the, and um, this is the map of observed precipitation distribution, and you can clearly see that in boreal summer, uh, the heavy precipitation band is located north, okay? and this is the zone of mean plot, and the peak of tropical precipitation is clearly located to the north of the equator. Okay? Now let's contrast on um, with the boreal winter case. In winter, we have more insulation coming in uh, to the southern hemisphere, right? And so the northern hemisphere is cooler. Then we require the headless circulation to transport energy northward, right, toward the cooler hemisphere. Then in the uh, lower branch, moisture is transported southward, and the ascending branch or the ITCC will be located to the south of the equator. So here shows, again, the map of precipitation. Compared to boreal summer, you can see that the heavy precipitation band has been shifted um, somewhat southward. And this is the zone of mean plot, and the peak is located um, to the south of the equator. Right? 
So this is telling you that this ITCC, or the ascending branch of the Hadley circulation, can be understood from the um, hemi dif hemispherically differential um, energy balance. Okay. So Hadley cell transports energy to the cooler hemisphere, from warm to cool. cool, um, warm to cool. So then, uh, then, the, then we need to have the stronger headless cell in, uh, in this way. So the, uh, the moisture is transported toward the um, warmer hemisphere, and that's why the ITCC is located um, in the different, uh, relatively warmer hemisphere. Right. So, but where, what is um, striking in this um, perspective is that it's saying that uh, the headless cell may respond to any hemispherically differential heating even when the heating is positioned well outside of the tropics, right? Let's say the radiation balance uh, is the same between the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere in the tropics, okay? However, if the uh, radiation balance um, is, um, is not satisfied in the extra tropics, then that imbalance has, has to be satisfied by modulating the ITCC location, okay? So then the question arises, uh, this is the question I asked you earlier, what meridional locations do you think are most effective at shifting the ITCC? Okay. So you can expect heating or cooling, this differential uh, thermal forcing, to be located near the equator, just one case. And in the other case, you can ex expect that differential heating to be located near the pole. Right. Which, which forcing do you think is most effect more effective at perturbing the ITCC? Can you raise your hand? Like uh, the tropical forcing would be more effective. Everybody votes for the extra tropical forcing. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> yeah. But actually, I think um, so. I think everybody like if if I didn't tell you at, at the story, then I, I think you would think that the, this low low latitude forcing would be more effective because that's closer to the ITCC. Right? However, the answer is not clear, and I, actually, the both um, answers are true. Uh, okay, before going in, uh, before giving you an answer, let me um, introduce the model. So this is how the surface temperature, uh, surface temperature um, is calculated in the model. So it's um, balanced by the net surface energy budget and the convergence of ocean energy transport. Okay, so for example, if there is more insulation coming in, then um, the surface temperature will rise. And in the model, so-called slab ocean model, we're neglecting the effect of ocean energy transport. So in the slab ocean model, uh, this part is zero. zero okay? And in another extreme um, model, which is the most complicated model called fully um, atmosphere ocean coupled model, the ocean energy transport is determined by an ocean model. So there is um, ocean current and ocean temperature is also um, calculated interactively. However, these fully coupled models are very, very computationally expensive to run. So as an intermediate step, one can parameterize the effect of ocean energy transport. Okay. But for simplicity, uh, for theoretical development, uh, we used this slab ocean model. Okay. So we just neglected the ocean energy transport. So in that model, um, the surface temperature is uh, going to be determined by the net surface energy budget. So, and this is how we perturb uh, so-called the control climate, right? So, so in, in all cases, we're going to make the northern hemisphere warmer and the southern hemisphere cooler. We're just putting in this kind of heating to the surface, okay? Heating in the northern hemisphere and um, um, cooling in the southern hemisphere, right? And, but uh, these um, different colors um, indicate different perturbed cases. So in one case, we put forcing in this uh, equatorial region, and in on the other extreme case, we're putting in cooling and heating in this polar uh, polar region. Okay, so we're varying the meridional position of thermal forcing systematically from the low to high latitudes. But the reason why the magnitude of this heating differs is because the area in the low latitude region is larger, right? Because this is sphere, the area is larger in the low latitude, so we need to put uh, less um, um, maxima in the low latitude to have the area weighted heating to be the same in all cases, okay? So then what we can do is uh, contrast the ITCC position in this case and this case, right? That's what we're gonna do. 
Okay, so here, th this, um, this is the tropical forcing case, so which is this red um, case. And as you go this way, we're putting this, those are the cases where the forcing is located in the extra tropics. Okay. Then uh, what we see is in this model, in this model, this is what you expect, right? If you ask um, to elementary uh, school students, they're going to answer that this tropical forcing is more effective because it's closer, right? That's what we expect. Right? So in some model, that is the answer. But in other model, you actually expect more ITCC response to the extra tropical forcing, which is remarkable uh, to me. Right? So, um, and this is the model with no clouds. Right? In the climate model, uh, there is cloud, and that's the actual largest uncertainty in, uh, in our community. So for theoretical development, we actually can have a model with no clouds. So with no clouds, we expect some natural answer. But with clouds, which is actually more realistic than you expect this um, surprising answer. Right? But, and that's because of the nonlinear cloud rigidity effect. But I just want, to, I want you to um, know that the extra tropical forcing can be even more important than the low latitude forcing for perturbing the ITCC location. So, so far, I've told you that um, hemispherically differential thermal forcing, regardless of its um, meridional location, can have a significant impact on the ITCC location. And that we have um, understood it uh, based on the atmospheric energy balance. <coughs> then the question arises as to whether the climate system would respond similarly when the ocean is allowed to transport energy. Right. So um, I told you that um, uh, for simplicity, uh, we have neglected the effect of ocean energy transport. Right? However, in reality, both atmosphere and ocean can transport energy. Right? So if, if, you, if we um, somehow um, perturb the climate by putting in heating and cooling, then both atmosphere and ocean can respond. Right? So imagine an extreme case when the ocean completely um, balances that um, energy perturbation. Then the atmosphere or the header circulation doesn't need to respond, right? Then in that case, the ITCC response will be muted, right? So there will be a competition between the atmosphere and ocean energy transport um, for modulating the ITCC position. Right? So, uh, and, um, and more recent studies actually that incorporate fully coupled models exhibit a range of responses in the ITCC position to extra tropical forcing. So that means, so in one model, what they did is um, they cooled the southern extra tropics. Then you, uh, from earlier theoretical work, we expect the ITCC to be shifted northward, right? Away from the cooled hemisphere, this one. That's the slab ocean model result. However, more complicated, this fully coupled model result uh, shows a uh, sm smaller ITCC response, which is expected, right? But in some cases, in response to this differential cooling, we have hemispherically symmetric increase in rainfall, which is hard to explain. And also in, so I'm here, I'm telling, I'm showing you that in these models, these fully coupled models, um, depending on the model, they give you different answer. Right? So there is a range of tropical precipitation response to extra tropical perturbation in fully coupled models. So it's not as simple as what we expect from the slab ocean models. And that's actually due to the range of energy flux responses to extra tropical perturbation. So as I told you, in some model, the ocean is more effective at balancing the energy transport than we expect smaller um, ITCC response. But in, in other models, uh, ocean and atmosphere are both important. In that case, we expect the ITCC to be shifted. Right? But these uh, studies, they are independent studies, so they have uh, somewhat different experimental design. So we have actually proposed a um, model intercomparison project, MIP. Uh, we named it as Extra Tropical Tropical Interaction MIP, ATM MIP. And um, these are the um, main um, coordinators, and I'm the leader of this international effort. And we're asking the um, model international modeling um, centers to run their fully coupled models, which is really expensive to run, um, under this um, proposed protocol. And then under this systematically designed experiment, we expect to um, uh, answer to many um, important key questions. Right? But that's 
these are very, um, this has to be international effort because it's expensive to run. Um, however, for theoretical understanding, I believe that it's actually better to reduce the complexity of the model. Okay. So, um, in my group is actually um, conducting a theoretical work uh, and we pr parameterize the effect of ocean energy transport to bridge the gap between the theoretical understanding and the fully coupled model results. So I will just give you just a concept. Um, and this is the surface temperature, how the surface temperature is um, calculated in the slab ocean model. Right? There is no ocean energy transport. However, we can add a complexity by parameterizing the ocean energy transport. So here we're just saying that the ocean energy transport is um, accomplished by the so-called Ekman flow. So we're only considering the meridional Ekman flow. So there is no uh, so-called uh, so thermohaline line deep ocean circulation that I introduced earlier. But systematically, we can add complexity. Okay. So our strategy is to compare the integration with, with and without this Ekman advection. Okay. And then we're again, we're going to warm the northern hemisphere and cool the southern hemisphere. And uh, in the slab ocean model, what we expect is uh, the northward shift of the ITCZ. Right? That's the, this dashed line. Right? So you, ex you have clear northward ITCZ shift in response to this differential heating. Right? However, with this ECMA advection, we actually have even opposite, reversed response in the ITCZ. And then we were able to understand that, that theoretically, but I won't go into um, the details. So, but our results suggest that the ECMA advection may potentially play a critical role in the coupled climate system uh, with dynamic ocean. So this is the last slide uh, that summarizes um, our um, framework. Uh, so in response to any differential hemisphere, uh, hemisp like cooling in one hemisphere and heating in, one hem uh, in the other hemisphere can affect the ITCC location because the energy balance has to be accomplished. Right. So in this case, northern hemisphere is warmer, then we need the heli circulation to transport energy toward the cooler southern hemisphere, then moisture will be transported uh, towards the warmer hemisphere, and the ITCC will be located in the differentially warmed northern hemisphere. However, the magnitude of the ITCC um, location response is um, sensitive to the partitioning of energy transport between the atmosphere and ocean. Right? So if, the, in, if um, the ocean energy transport is more effective at um, um, balancing the energy transport, then this headless circulation uh, doesn't need to respond as much, then in which case the ITCC, res ITCC won't um, be perturbed as much. So we're at the moment um, trying to build a hierarchy of ocean models to assess the, um, the role of ocean um, um, circulation in modulating this tropical precipitation response. Right, uh, this is it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>